Welcome back everyone, Energy Fabricator here. In this video we're going to have a look at a whole range of parts and tools and equipment that I've been able to acquire over the last few months of pretty intensive salvaging. Uh, we're going to look at this vintage hand crank generator here as well as some microfluidics parts, some electrical meters, some electrical parts, power supplies, lasers, uh, pneumatic tools and fittings, I've got a thyristor and some SCRs bellows transformers, vacuum pump and some high voltage insulators as well as some other bits and pieces so let's get straight into it. Now the first thing we'll take a look at are the transformers that I've been able to salvage out of all types of different equipment. This little guy came out of a rack mount PA amplifier uh, I'm not too sure what the input and output voltages are, but it was easy enough to strip out, so we've got that little guy there. I also managed to score this DIN rail mountable power supply. There's no electronics on board here, it's just straight transformer action. DIN rail on the bottom there. Um, 240 volts input and either a 24 or 48 volt output. Uh, I've already got a little project in mind for that which we'll talk about shortly. I've also got this toroidal transformer 240 volts on the input winding here and I've got a midpoint grounded secondary with 28 volts on each side so that was pretty cool and the next transformer that I found was another toroid here which also came out of the rack mount PA amplifier so we've got 240 volts input there and a whole range of output voltages via these other windings here so I can't, I've put this under, under a test condition I can't really remember what the output voltages were but they range between 9 volts and 48 volts from memory um, so that's a nice little power supply, good for a couple of amps at least. Um, the next transformer that I was able to find was another toroidal shaped transformer. Again, 240 volts input via this winding here. And then we, as you can see, we've got a range of different windings for different output voltages there. Again, good for another couple of amps on each output winding for sure. Um, nice little unit encased in epoxy it seems and um, this came out of a working piece of medical diagnostic equipment from memory uh, so yeah we'll look for a little project for that guy uh, I also found this in another rack mount unit um, it's a little 240 volt input and 5 volt output switch mode power supply uh, it'll put out 5 volts at 8 amps, although I wouldn't trust it with 8 amps with that little heat sink there. Um, I'd say it's a lot lower than that on the output current, but nonetheless, it's a good little quick power supply. Now, the next thing I got was this guy here. I've actually got two of these. Um, it came out of a uh, metal halide lamp ballast assembly. Uh, it's a 1000 watt ballast, so I've got two of those, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be using these in my black box power supply. It'll help me to reduce a bit of weight and space instead of using a number of smaller ballasts. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I've been waiting for a couple of big ones and finally found them. So that completes the ballast requirement for my black box power supply. Got everything I need for that. Um, so we'll be making some progress on that shortly. Uh, the next power supply that I got, well, it's not actually a power supply, it's more of a um, DC brushless motor controller board, uh, but with a 48 volt input, which is what I'm planning on using this guy here for. Uh, with a 48 volt input, this thing will control a 48 volt DC brushless motor, and it just so happens that I have the motor that came with this board 
Um, it's not actually a motor, it's a vacuum pump and also a pressure pump. Um, it's not a vacuum pump that I've had previously. I've, I've got a lab grade um, vacuum pump but it will not run continuously at atmospheric pressure whereas this pump that I've just picked up will run at uh, atmospheric pressure which is good for specific uh, tests and experiments that I have planned um, which my lab grade vacuum pump will not be able to handle so um, now we've got a vacuum pump for every occasion and we can proceed with those experiments which you will see in the first half of this year guaranteed so this is the vacuum pump that I picked up on this side here we've got the vacuum line itself and this is the vacuum exhaust port and on this side we've got the high pressure line obviously power comes in here and it also came with this vibration isolation kit which just consists of an aluminium plate with springs attached to it but I've tested the unit and it definitely comes in handy that vibration isolation there is a fair bit of movement in the unit when it's powered on and it vibrates pretty quickly um, so as I said the most important part to this is that it has a vacuum line which can operate at atmospheric pressure continuously without a problem so that's going to be very important coming up in a very soon to be aired experiment um, as you can see on both ends we've got a fan and grill and I guess there's nothing more to show I've got to get it all hooked up into a nice little assembly with the driver circuit and power supply switching all that sort of jazz but once I do that we'll get it all turned on hooked up and start doing some experiments with it so we've got three more power supplies to look at quickly before we move on to something a little bit more exciting this guy here takes 240 volts in via this IEC plug here we've got the on and off switch connected here and on the output side uh, we have the option of 25 volts at 3.3 amps or 32 volts at 800 milliamps uh, so just another little switch mode power supply to have on the shelf ready to go for whenever it's needed uh, the next power supply that I picked up is this guy right here nice chunky little beast um, it takes 240 volts on the input it's a switch mode power supply again but this one here has 12 volts across these output terminals here at 10 amps we've got a voltage adjustment screw here and a fuse and this thing is a beast it's pretty chunky so it's a nice little bench top power supply or a um, high powered power supply for maybe some HHO experiments or something not too sure but it's there ready to go just like the rest of them the last one that I picked up was this guy here which is the one that I'm most happy about finding believe it or not because I've been looking for a 24 volt uh, power supply to drive all of the uh, contactors in my black box power supply so as I've said before I don't want any electronics on board so I've been steering away from all of the switch mode power supplies that I've got but I've been finding it hard to find a um, 24 volt transformer with enough amps, amps behind it to drive all of the um, contactors and pilot lamps and all that sort of stuff that's on board the black box power supply so I think this should have more than enough current to do the work that's needed in that unit so that one is definitely going in the box because it does a job and believe it or not it's black so it's going to match pretty well and it's going to do the job so let's move on to something a little bit more exciting this is the laser that I managed to score out of a piece of medical diagnostic equipment it took me about half an hour to pull this assembly out believe it or not because it was shrouded with other bits and pieces all the way around it um, so that was quite a bit of a disassembly operation to get this out in one piece um, but as you can see we've got the laser assembly here we've got a big machined aluminium block here the laser fits straight through here 
Uh, we've got these mounting lugs on either end here, which is screwed into place. And on this block, we've got a machine surface here. And sitting on top of that machine surface is this assembly here, which looks to be some sort of lens or collimator. Um, and the light would go through the laser, through this block, and into the sampling test area, which is over here in this clear acrylic. Um, obviously we've got an input port here for the fluid and we've got a whole bunch of ports on the back side here I'm not too sure how this whole assembly works but um, obviously a sample of fluid was going through here at some point exiting the base port here and we've also got an RF signal input here which was going through to some sort of um, RF module in the back here behind the sample and we also had some sensors via this little plug and wires here going into the back side and I'm not too sure what that's all about but there's adjusting screws here for it to line this whole assembly up um, with the laser light itself um, I'll probably get rid of this assembly and just keep it on the shelf I guess but um, we'll definitely be using this laser and collimator I've just got to pull the laser out of the block by undoing these two screws, checking the sticker, and we'll get some specs and um, power it up. But yeah, that's a pretty cool little laser. And, geez, I, I guess I wouldn't find one of those again in a hurry. So I'm pretty happy to have scored this. Um, I guess until we get it up and running, nothing more to say about it. But that is pretty cool. We're looking forward to getting some laser light going through a vacuum. See what we can do there. Now we're back to this little vintage hand crank generator that I picked up at the Trash and Treasure for a bargain basement price of $3. Now the guy that was selling it didn't even know what it was and he just wanted to offload it and I was equally as keen to be the new owner. So regardless of whether or not it worked, I bought it and I was pretty keen to test it. So the only way I could do that at the time without a multimeter was to put my fingers across the terminals and give it a bit of a crank. Now when I did that, uh, I got a very nasty shock and if I turn this multimeter on to the AC setting, put a bit of backlighting on there and give it a crank, you'll see why I got such a shock. As you can see we're up to 100 volts there roughly. It's fluctuating because I'm not keeping a consistent speed but if I go a bit faster we could probably get it to about 120, 130 volts and it does go even higher than that. Um, so we'll just turn that back off because I want to give you a bit of a closer look. But this thing is pretty old school. There is uh, no doubt about it. There's the... Actually, I'll get a bit closer for you. You can see the uh, provisional patent numbers there. And we've got a 115.A stamp on the bottom. I don't know if that means 115 milliamps or thereabouts, but um, there you go. Now it's in pretty good condition still, nothing wrong with this at all, apart from one of the terminals, which I'll show you in a second. But um, inside here, we've got a nice little gear assembly, which drives a shaft, which comes out the other end here. And on this shaft is a magnet that rotates inside a core, and the core fills up this whole unit. It's a pretty heavy little transformer. And on the top section of the core, the laminated core, is a winding. And that's the winding there with the output terminals here and here. Now, as you can see, the output terminal here is fully encased in a plastic uh, connector, I guess you could call it. Um, on this side, it's sort of snapped off in half and it's sort of just floating about in there but there is a still a good electrical connection to the uh, winding so all we've got to do is get in there with a bit of epoxy glue that back into place and apart from that 
it is 100% good to go. Um, so that's that. I don't know what I'll be using that for, but um, that is definitely a rare find. So there you go. Now until recently my capabilities with pneumatics was pretty limited. I didn't have enough parts to put a test assembly together. But as you can see, after a few visits to the scrapyard, I've managed to salvage a whole bunch of different types of pneumatic cylinders and fittings. So I've got this test assembly set up here, which we're going to plug into some compressed air in a second. Uh, but before we do that, these two larger units are pretty impressive. They've got a dual rod setup going on in here, uh, so there's no twisting and they're also magnetically operated so we can control the stroke length with a reed switch uh, if we also used a solenoid operated valve uh, to control the stroke. Now I've also got a whole bunch of little guys here we've only got one set up in this test assembly just to show it working but that's got a 5mm stroke length and I've got a bunch of these slightly larger units and these just have these screw fittings on the end so we can take these fittings off and put whatever we want onto the shaft uh, but that's how they came out of the scrapyard so that's how we will use them for the time being I've got a valve here and a push button switch sitting behind this guy uh, and I've also got a flow control valve here and we've also got silencers on the valve itself and one of the silencers is adjustable so we can control the speed of the stroke. So we can do that in two ways. We can control the speed of the stroke by using these adjustable silencers or we can use adjustable flow control valves. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. We'll plug this into some, comp some compressed air and I'll show this setup working. That's plugged in. We've got the push button switch here. So I'll depress that now. And you can see them all extend. If I release it, they all fall down. Press it again. And release. There you go. I'll just disconnect the air because the fittings are all done up by hand and it's a bit leaky. But as you can see it all works. If I bring you in a bit closer here, you can see how I've got it set up. We've got the, um, let me get you more stable there. We've got the air input going into here through these fittings, through this little Y connector. One goes into the valve here, the other one goes to this push button switch. Goes into this splitter here so we can select between either this switch or if we wanted to have another way to actuate this uh, set of pneumatic cylinders, we could plug it into here. We need this module here, we can't just go straight in via a, a, um, a T connector. You really need that module because of uh, exhaust gas reasons. Um, so we can either operate off of this unit, this unit here, or another switch of any sort off the other line there. Um, now on the back side here, we've got the silencers. Uh, that one there is just a standard silencer. This one here is adjustable, so as I was saying, we can control the speed by just screwing that in and out, and that'll control the speed of the um, stroke itself. You've got the in and output lines here. You can see one goes straight over to the back here and to the back of this one here. It also goes off to this um, T connector back there, that one there, and it goes off to every single one of these cylinders here, and that pushes them all up. And these are actually spring return, so once the air goes away, they just pop straight back down by themselves. This one here also has air going in but it also has air coming out so it's air operated in both directions. 
same goes with these larger units here got air coming in here and here so the air coming in here controls this stroke and the air coming into here controls the back stroke um, and as I was saying we've got the flow control valve here so we can adjust that to control the stroke length um, the sorry the stroke speed uh, of retraction so that's my setup it seems to work just fine all these cylinders are pretty good so I'll disassemble that put them all away for a future project hopefully um, and I've also got a couple of these electrical 12 volt um, solenoid valves here so I've got two of those they, they work just fine I've plugged them in and tested them I've also got actually we'll have a look at this first got a whole bunch of fittings here quick connect fittings and I picked up this module here which is um, a microfluidics unit um, and I've got some other like syringe style modules that screw into these fittings here and you can see it's got tracks machined into here somehow in, in 3D it's a one piece unit so it's one acrylic block so it seems um, with six solenoids solenoid valves on the top here and we had microfluidic tubes coming out the base here and it was a whole bunch of other stuff connected to that but I'll show you some of those parts later but I didn't keep all of them uh, I also managed to score a few more uh, flow control valves these ones are pretty heavy duty stainless steel ones pretty impressive looking um, and I also managed to pick up these things here I don't even know what they are they're quick connect fitting fittings um, but I'm not too sure what this thing is in here they're actually directional fittings so there's an arrow pointing in one direction and there seems to be some sort of stainless steel um, mesh filter I guess you could call it in there but the aperture of the hole inside them is very very small uh, it's a very fine mesh grill separating the the two halves of the um, the fitting itself. They're all color coded, but yeah, as I said, I'm not too sure what they are. I like to try and take one apart and take a look inside. It doesn't seem to be a valve or anything. Uh, maybe some sort of unidirectional filter of some sort. I'm not too sure, uh, but I got a whole bag full of them, so that's pretty handy. Now while we're talking about pneumatics, I thought it would be a good time to show you some air tools that I picked up recently from a tool company I did some work for last year. These tools were all taken out of stock for a marketing photo shoot at some, some stage th throughout the year and instead of putting them back into stock they decided to just get rid of the whole palette of parts and tools and throw them out so um, I decided to take these ones home with me. This guy here is just a little um, blow gun air comes in the back here we've got a nice tight little nozzle for some high pressure air there and I also picked up this guy here and um, I took the fitting that was on there off and I've actually replaced it with this guy here which is a specialty fitting and it will blow a bit of an air curtain instead of a, um, a nice tight beam of air and that's just good for light dusting and cleaning larger areas so we've left that on there and these were the um, standard fittings that came with that second gun that I just showed you there um, I also picked up this air drill and this thing is pretty cool we've got the air fitting at the base here we've got forward and reverse and a nice little chuck on the end there um, I'm guessing this is going to get pretty cold after a bit of use because there's no insulation there um, but I got it for free so who cares uh, the next thing I got was this cutoff wheel this is a pretty handy little device and we've got a little safety switch here to depress before we actually activate it so that's pretty handy nice little guard and what seems to be a two and a half three inch 
wheel, yeah, three inch diameter cut off wheel there. Um, so looking forward to oiling that up and giving it a bit of a test run. I also picked up a staple gun here and I've tried this out, this works pretty well. Got some brass staples that actually fit that staple gun too so that was handy to have um, and I also picked up this little spray gun uh, I don't think it'll be good for shellacking Tesla coils or anything but maybe lacquering them or something it's got a very fine nozzle there um, but again got it for free so can't complain at all now if you remember earlier I showed you this acrylic block with the solenoids attached to it now it is a microfluidics dosing unit or dispensing unit um, as you can see I didn't have these attached before but these are actually glass microfluidic syringes they're made for 250 microliters and as you can see they've got a plunger attached here so we can actually I'll get you in a bit closer we can actually dose certain amounts using these solenoids and these syringes uh, now these syringes were actually connected to a coupling device and that coupling was mounted onto a worm drive which was driven by some stepper motors and I managed to take not only this little assembly here but the stepper motors that drove these syringes as well as some other parts in the device um, this is one of the stepper motors that I got out of the unit and I actually got two of those and I also picked up two slightly larger ones as you can see here um, these ones have got a flexible coupling attached to the end of the shaft um, so we've got two of those and I also got myself one of these and they all came out of the same unit so I thought that was pretty cool now I know what you're thinking, I've got five of these stepper motors um, I should build a 3D printer well I'm way ahead of you, it probably won't happen this year but um, I'm accumulating the parts to do that project one day um, I also got this little gear reducer um, from the same assembly and it fits that belt and the gear on this motor here um, so that's pretty cool, that's the first step of building a um, 3D printer, so I'm pretty happy to have found those and just the right amount of stepper motors too, so um, I'll have to get myself a stepper motor driver board and um, we'll be that much closer to 3D printing. Now out of the same piece of medical equipment I was able to salvage a few more solenoid valves. These two here are actually 24 volt solenoid valves and the tube would actually run through that little slot there and the solenoid would actually extend once it was activated and crimp the actual hose that was running through it and these are pretty expensive little valves they're going for about sixty dollars on ebay so pretty happy with that score I've got two of those and I also managed to find six of these in there which are 24 volt solenoid valves again um, but again for the microfluidic side of the the unit that it was in so yeah six of those and out of another piece of equipment I was able to find nearly 40 of these these are just um, high pressure air fittings and because of the specialty shape of the nozzle I guess you can see there that little V shape it provides a bit of an air curtain and that's what they were used for in the unit. They were providing a bit of an air curtain for a cleaning roller, which cleaned and um, blew all the dust off of the material that was going through the roller. So yeah, got 40 of those. And let's move on to something else. Now for quite some time, going on three years now actually, um, I've had to make do with this little 1.3 amp hour 12 volt battery because, well, that's all I had. Um, until recently because I just picked up a couple of these guys here and these are 
12 volt batteries again, but 4.5 amp hour batteries. So I've got two of these guys. So we'll put them aside over here. I also picked up a couple of these, and these are 12 volt again at 4 amp hour each. So we've got four, four of those now. And I also picked up two of these guys, and these are 5 amp hour 12 volt batteries. So I thought that was pretty cool. So now we've got six batteries at over 4 amp hours. And I also managed to pick up a couple of these guys, 12 volts, 2.9 amp hours. So there's nearly 40 amp hours of battery right there. Uh, but the piece de resistance was um, this next one that I'm about to show you. And this guy is nearly the size of a car battery. It's pretty bloody huge. It's a 40 amp hour 12 volt battery. You can see the size of the terminals on it here. Pretty chunky. Now this one was actually brand new. It got written off because it was dropped in the warehouse and um, the lug was a bit smashed over and you can see if I turn it around here it's got a bit of a scratch on the side so it was written off and instead of throwing it out or scrapping it I decided to take it home and fix it so we just bent that back into a rough alignment again I didn't want to put too much stress on this connection here and it works just fine so we've got nearly 80 amp hours of 12 volt batteries with these smaller guys here and this larger one so I think that's more than enough to keep me going now if you're still with me at this stage it means I've already taken at least half an hour of your life away that you won't get back so we'll try and wrap this up pretty quickly this guy here is the um, little alarm siren buzzer thing that I've Salvaged. It's a 24 volt DC 25 milliamp unit. Um, we'll hook it up to 12 volts because at 24 volts it is bloody loud. Uh, so we'll just connect that up very quickly. So as you can see, that's pretty loud. At 24 volts, it's almost deafening when you're at this sort of range. Uh, but I thought that was pretty cool. I only needed to take off two screws to take this home. I don't know what I'll use it for. Probably never use it for a number of years, but um, pretty cool to have. Uh, the next thing I found was this little Hue Snap 5 analog multimeter. It's an AC volts and amps multimeter. Um, I'll bring it in closer so you can have a look at the analog meter itself um, now it does, as I said it does volts and amps we've got a little selector switch here for the different ranges of voltage and current and on this end we've got a clamp for our amps meter and on the back side here unfortunately I don't have the original leads but um, the leads went into these holes here. I've just got these screws in here at the moment so that I can connect some little spade terminals. Uh, but it, it doesn't take, it doesn't accept 4mm banana jack, so I'll have to make up some leads for that. Uh, but apart from that, it is 100% working. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Um, a cool little unit. And the other feature here is the um, rotating head on it so that we can have a nice little viewing angle depending on how we've got it set up uh, so that was pretty cool that was a cool find paid ten dollars for that down at the trash and treasure now I also found another multimeter down at the trash and treasure which is this Micronta unit it's come in the original box it's got the original instruction manual that you can see in front of you there uh, I've got the original leads that come with it and it's also got the original foam packaging I can tell just by looking at this that it hasn't had much in the way of usage so 
I'm pretty lucky to have found this in such good condition. I've even got the price tag still on the box here at $64.95. And we'll just take the foam packaging off here. And we've got a nice little flip stand so you can get a good viewing angle. And if I bring you in a bit closer here, you can see all of the features on the front panel got a nice little switching action here ohms adjust here and we go to AC or DC negative over on that switch we got our inputs here we got 1kV AC and 1kV DC and you can see the um, mirrored um, meter so that we can get a nice accurate reading lining up the needle properly um, so yeah a little micron to unit not a bad little score I think I paid about ten dollars for this guy here as well um, so having done that let's move on to some more electrical parts and we can wrap this video up and what you're looking at here is a bag full of 22 millimeter diameter switches and pilot lamps. Uh, I've got about 20 in here and I've also got about 10 uh, red pilot lamps which I've already mounted in the spare panel on the bottom of my black box power supply. Uh, we'll take a look at that in an upcoming video but the ones that I've got here are just your standard run-of-the-mill good quality switches um, push button I've got red ones, green ones um, and I've also got some up and down ones all different sorts um, generally they're all the same brand same quality and here's one of the green pilot lamps and I've got different types of pilot lamps as well we've got some that are incandescent some that are LED based uh, I've even got an emergency stop switch in the bag there just at the bottom so as I said 20 here and I've got another 10 that I've already mounted uh, so that was pretty handy. I only needed to take apart two different pieces of equipment to get all of those. The next batch of stuff that I got is this stuff here, DIN rail mounted parts. You can never have enough of these. And um, I generally keep the ones that are in really good condition if they're slightly damaged in any way, show any sign of wear and tear or corrosion in these terminals. I don't even bother with it. Um, they're easy enough to come by, so... I only keep the good quality stuff. So I got these guys here. I also picked up this contactor and a whole bunch of terminals here. Got another rail here with some more terminal blocks and some dividers. Push that back a bit. I've got this guy here with some more terminal blocks, some end stops. I've got an inline fuse holder and a relay. On the next panel, I have a couple more relays, some more terminal blocks here. On the next one, I've got more terminal blocks. Um, I don't know what these two guys are here, but a um, bit of googling should fix that problem. And the next one I have is this one, a couple of breakers, motor starter, and a um, heavy duty terminal block. Now, all of that, plus all of the other parts that I already had for DIN rail mounting, um, I've got about five or six lineal metres of parts altogether. Um, but I also picked up these guys here, these contactors. I got five of these, and I also managed to score two of these guys here well they're the same as these other ones except they've got auxiliaries attached to the top um, but unfortunately these ones run off of 110 volts not a standard voltage here in Australia so I'll probably get rid of these um, I've got more than enough contactors that run off 240 volts and 24 volts to get me out of trouble so I'll probably get rid of them pretty quickly but um, I thought that was pretty cool to get all of those parts. Um, 
I also have more parts than what I can mount on DIN rails because I've run out of DIN rails but as you can see I've got more terminal blocks in this box here and that pretty much covers all the parts that I've found that are DIN rail mountable over the last few months okay so I lied this DIN rail here is the last of it I've got two ABB switches here we've got a motor start contactor here and a um, auxiliary We've got another motor controller, some breakers, a couple of relays and two more of these ABB switches. Now I'm definitely going to be using these to activate the auto transformers in my black box power supply. I really like these switches mainly because you really need to apply a bit of force to turn these switches. You need two fingers and you need to really apply a lot of force without it it's just not going to turn you can't knock that with one finger it's almost impossible you really need the the thumb and the forefinger and apply a lot of force before you get that to flick over so there's no accidental switching going on it's all done on purpose now I recently picked up a whole handful of thyristors and SCRs unfortunately I'm not going to show you all of them they all look the same but I thought I would at least show you this guy here it's the biggest one I've got it's um, six inches long overall and um, one and a half inches tall and one and a half inches wide so it's pretty chunky it's a Mitsubishi TM200 DZ-H and this guy will handle 800 volts at 200 amps you can see we've got some copper terminations here another copper strap joining these two terminals and on the top here I've got this little snub, snubber board um, it's a bit damaged one of the capacitors is broken but that's easily fixed got plenty of those in stock um, but yeah, that is pretty chunky. That is the most powerful thyristor that I have now. I've got about 15 or 20 of these at least now. Um, all different voltage ratings and current ratings. But yeah, as I said, this one is the most powerful one that I have. Handles the most current at 200 amps. Now I've also got a whole uh, bucket full, or at least two 20 litre buckets full of other sorts of bits and pieces everything from ferrite cores to rubber boots to transistors uh, we've got some bearings we've got ferrite cores got more transistors um, rectifiers and I've also got another DIN rail here with some emergency stop relay switches attached to it um, I've got heaps of stuff I'm not going to go through all of that because it's just going to get really boring so we'll move on to the final thing I wanted to show you and that'll be the end of it as I mentioned at the start of the video I've got a whole bunch of high voltage insulators we've got this and this and this and that one I've also got that one and that one and that one and that one and that one, and that one. We've also got that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. And this, and this, and this, and this, and this. We've got, and that one, and that one, and that one, and this, and that one, and that one, and that one. This one, and that one, and this one. I've also got a few more, but probably won't be able to get them all in the shop here but you get the idea I've got a whole bunch of them they just need a bit of a wipe down with the damp rag and they'll be as good as new there was three times as much as as what you can see here down at the scrapyard but most of them were chipped or damaged in some way these are all in perfect condition except for one this one right here it's got a bit of a chip along the top edge but I took it anyway because I wanted a set of four um, but yeah that's about it, so um, if you'll excuse me, I'll leave you all to your own devices and I'm going to shoot off and build myself a flux capacitor. If you like this video, please subscribe and leave some comments. Thanks for watching.